What are you doing? Oh, just putting together this puzzle I got for Christmas. You're working a little violently, aren't you? Wait, that piece doesn't even go there. Well, I can't find the piece that goes there, so it's close enough. But that's not how a puzzle works. You know what, Amber? I like to do my puzzles like I balance my checkbook. Sometimes you just gotta fudge the numbers. But isn't a puzzle about putting the right pieces in the right places to build a complete picture? Whatever you're putting together here doesn't even make sense. Sometimes you gotta compromise, Amber. So we are continuing our series, Compromised Christianity. Now, compromise is not always a bad thing. Uh, most of our relationships require some kind of compromise. Um, I've shared before uh, how my wife and I compromised when we first got a dog, and we were trying to determine where the dog would sleep. Many of you know this story. Um, when we first got the dog, determined where we were going to sleep, growing up, my dog slept in the laundry room. Growing up, my wife's dog slept on the bed. So when it came to where our dog would sleep, we compromised, and our dog slept on the bed. Um, actually, I'm good with the dog sleeping on the bed. But compromise can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing, like compromising our faith. It is tempting to compromise key aspects of our faith. Compromising our faith can make life easier, Compromising our faith doesn't, you know, always seem like a big deal, and sometimes we don't even realize it when we're compromising our faith. Uh, in this series, we're highlighting the different ways we compromise when it comes to our faith and the danger that it can pose um, and how our faith is weakened when we give ground. Uh, now, the first week of this series, Pastor Devin showed how syncretism, the blending of our faith um, with something idolatrous, it's uh, dangerous to our faith. We can't mix our faith with other systems of belief. We have to make a choice about what we believe. And then last week, Brett talked about compromising our commitment to the community of faith. Uh, the Christian faith is meant to be lived out in community. And when we compromise our commitment to our community of faith, it is much easier for our faith to be snuffed out. One of our directives here at TFRC is transformed lives, where we live visibly different lives because of our faith in Jesus. Jesus calls us to live out our faith each and every day, and every day we will be tempted to compromise how Jesus taught us to live. This morning, we are focusing on compromised conscience. There were values that Jesus held and lived by, and as followers of Jesus, we are called to live by those same values. But it's really easy to compromise them. And while the world promotes values different from Jesus, and there is outside pressure for us to compromise our faith, um, there is a more basic source of what causes us to compromise. One that does not come from the outside world. Our scripture for this morning is Mark chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. Uh, you can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Mark is the second book in the New Testament right after Matthew, or you can just look up Mark chapter 7 on your phones. Uh, Mark 7 begins with the Pharisees confronting Jesus. Um, his disciples were not practicing a ceremonial washing before they ate. And it wasn't a hygiene issue. It was about um, a ritual cleanliness. And so the, from the Pharisees' point of view, because the disciples didn't uh, do this ceremonial washing, they were eating with defiled hands. And Jesus, he rebukes their overemphasis on their traditions, and that is basically where we pick up the story. Our scripture reader for this morning is uh, Lindsay Higley. So Lindsay, would you please make your way on up to the podium? As she does, I'm going to ask if you're able, please stand and face the center of the room. Uh, we uh, stand because we believe this is the word of God. And we read from the center of the room is because Scripture is central to our faith. It is our primary lens for our faith. And so, Lindsay, whenever you are ready, please read Mark chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. 
Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile in a person. Lindsay, thank you very much. You may be seated. Now, most of you know that I am a Green Bay Packer fan. They didn't make the playoffs this year. That's okay. God is still good. Aaron Rodgers may or may not be back with the team next year. That's okay. God is still good. My son graduated from college last spring. The last time the Packers won the Super Bowl, he was in elementary school. Uh, That's okay. God is still good. Now, the last time they won the Super Bowl, their starting left guard was a Boise State alum, Darren College. And shortly after they won that Super Bowl, someone from church bought a signed Darren College jersey and gave it to me. And that Christmas, my wife had it framed, and I have it here. I hid it back here because I didn't want anyone stealing it. So, there it is. Um, Now, what my wife did with this jersey is a common practice when it comes to sports memorabilia. Uh, We put our sports memorabilia in frames and cases because we do not um, want them to be compromised. I don't want this jersey, I don't want some Viking fan coming up here and throwing coffee on the jersey, okay? Um, So I don't want this jersey to get stained, I don't want it to get dusty, I don't want it to get ripped. So I put it in a frame to keep it from being compromised, to keep anything from the outside from defiling it. Now, that was the mindset of the Pharisees in this story. They didn't want anything from the outside compromising their holiness. Their ceremonial washing practice was like being protected in a frame. It kept them from being defiled from anything from the outside. And Jesus pushed back on this idea. For Jesus the most likely source of being compromised came from the inside, not the outside. The biggest threat to compromising our conscience is the heart. Our hearts lead us to compromise what is right and wrong. And for Jesus, this is fundamental. This is something everybody needs to know. Going back to verse 14, it says, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. So Jesus is talking with the Pharisees about his disciples. And he tells the Pharisees that they are being hypocritical in their practice because they have used the traditions of men to compromise the commands of God. And they have completely missed the point. And the point they have missed is so important that Jesus ends the conversation with them and he calls the crowd together. Now there is only one other time that I could find in all the gospels that Jesus calls a crowd to him. There are dozens of times that crowds follow Jesus and sometimes he teaches them, sometimes he feeds them, and sometimes he tries to get away from them. But there are only two times when he calls the crowd to him. Now, the other time, I'm going to share what he said the other time that he called the crowd to him. The one other time he called the crowd to him, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. You see, it was a fundamental truth about following Jesus. And now here is Jesus, and he's going to share another fundamental truth. And so he calls the crowd to them and says, look, everybody, listen. 
And what is fundamental is that humanity is fallen. Going back to verses 15 to 20, where he says, nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. And after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. And in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. And he went on. It's what comes out of a person is what defiles them. It's not what happens on the outside that defiles us. We are defiled on the inside. Now, there's a theological term for this, a theological concept called total depravity. Total depravity means that every part of us is tainted with sin. The fall of humanity in Genesis 3 impacts us to this day. We are not human in the way that God intended us to be. We are fallen humanity. And fallen humanity has a sinful nature. It impacts every aspect of our lives. It impacts us body, mind, and will. The grip that sin has on our bodies is why we get sick and die. Sin affects our minds and our thinking. And we can still think and reason, but our minds and our reasoning has become darkened. And our wills are captive to sin. We are enslaved by the evil desires of our heart. Now, it's not that 100% of everything we do is evil. That's not the case. We can do good things. It's just that we never do anything that is 100% pure and good. Everything we think and do is tainted by sin. It is what comes out of us that defiles us. And yes, the world throws temptations our way, but our hearts are already prone to compromise from within. It is our nature. The temptation to compromise comes from within, and the outside influences of the world, they simply tap into what is already within us. Now, Jesus tells them this, and even the disciples don't get it. They still have this thinking that, no, no, we just have to stay pure and remain untainted. But they don't understand they already are tainted. It is a popular belief to think that people are born innocent, and then we are corrupted as we get older. And I get it, because when we look at babies... They're so innocent. They are so cute. How can they be born tainted with sin? They're adorable, and they look innocent. But anyone who's ever been a parent, let me just ask you a question. Go back to like the first year of your child's life, and when your baby was hungry or needed to burp or had a dirty diaper, what did they do? Yes, thank you. Uh, somebody cried, so that was very good. That's exactly what they do. They whined and they cried. And if you think about the times that your baby cried, when they cried, did they have any consideration for all the other things you had to do? When your babies cried, did they care that it was 2 o'clock in the morning? When your babies cried, did they care that you were exhausted? The answer, of course, is no, no, and no. Babies are self-centered. They want to eat when they're hungry, they want to burp when they're gassy, and they want to be changed when they're dirty. And they will cry and cry and cry until they get their way. That's what it means to be a baby. We don't have to teach babies to be selfish. They are born that way. Now, as we get older... The only way that we will be less selfish is if we are taught to be less selfish. Children, as they grow, do not naturally become less selfish. Terrible twos, anyone? 
the self-centered nature that we are born with doesn't go away just because we get older. It stays with us and impacts our entire lives. It is from within that we are defiled. And it is a fundamental truth that Jesus wanted everyone to understand. You see, our hearts and our desires, they are infected. Now, not all of our desires are bad. Even if none of our desires are 100% good, it doesn't mean they're all bad. But our desires are infected. Now, I was a communications major in college. So what that means is sometimes I think about how we use words and what words we use and how we use similar words in different situations and what does that tell us. Um, I'm kind of weird that way. The words that we use for desires and passions, I do find interesting. Think about some of the phrases, some of the idioms that we use for when we want something or are passionate about something. Like, hey, you know, it's almost, you know, spring is coming. I know the weather doesn't say that, but spring's eventually going to be here, at least by June, and I have the golf itch. I have the golf itch. Or I have a burning desire. Or I am red hot about this new song. Itch, burn, red hot. They are all ways that we say when we want something. They're idioms for desires that we have. Now, these words go together in another context. If I have something on my arm, on my skin, that itches, is burning, and is red, um, it's a good chance I have an infection <laughs> and I need to go to the doctor and get it checked out. The same words that we use for desires are the same words we use to describe an infection. I just find that really interesting. So the next time you have a burning desire, you may want to double check to make sure it's not an infected one. Jesus gives us a list of some sinful desires that come from our hearts. And I'll go back to verses 21 through 23 and read them, where it says, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. I took some time to kind of look over this list and think about it, and I'm still not entirely sure why Jesus picked these 12 particular items to make his point. One, they are all pretty common. Most of us would be guilty of at least half of them, if not more. Um, but I tried to find some commonalities between them, and I'm not going to claim, I'm not claiming, that Jesus would group the 12 like I am grouping the 12, but I've summarized these 12 sins into four groups. And the first group is sins of what I'm calling sins of the appetite. Sins of the appetite that come from within. Sexual immorality, adultery, lewdness. Now, our appetites include what we eat and drink and other innate desires. But Jesus doesn't mention things like gluttony or drunkenness here. The three that Jesus mentions all deal with our sexual appetites. And when I think about the fact that the pornography industry globally is worth $100 billion, and there's an estimated 25 to 28 million people trapped in human trafficking, most of them women and children, I think Jesus was on to something when he chose to highlight our sexual appetites as particularly dangerous. Our appetites can defile us. We also have sins of authenticity, authenticity that come from within. Theft, deceit, envy. Theft can take many forms. It doesn't just have to be taking something from someone else. We can cheat on our taxes. We can cheat in our business practices. Deceit is hiding our true selves and intention. Envy is secretly resenting someone else's good fortune, skills, or station in life. 
And rather than being upfront with who we are or what we think, we hide from each other. And we pretend to be something we are not. There are sins of anger that come from within. Murder, malice, slander. And murder occurs because getting rid of someone, whatever the situation may be, getting rid of someone is better than keeping them around. That's fundamentally why murder happens. Malice is simply having bad intentions towards someone. And the reason we have bad t intentions towards someone is because we don't want them around. Slander is saying false things about someone to ruin their reputation. And we do that because we don't want them around. Look, people make us angry. And when they make us angry, we don't want them around. But what anger is meant to do, it's meant to motivate us to resolve a situation while honoring the one who is doing something we don't like. There are sins of ego which come from within. Arrogance, greed, folly. Arrogance is just simply pride, thinking that I am better than others. Greed is ego-related in the sense that greed is acquiring as much as possible without any regards for others. Folly in this context is not being silly or goofy. Folly is a reckless disregard for morality. It is the fool that is talked about in the book of Proverbs. Now, one who has an inflated ego, they don't think the rules apply to them. The inflated ego scoffs at morality. I will do what I want. They are reckless. They are foolish. These are all ways, and surely it is not an exhaustive list, that our hearts compromise our faith. And as Pastor Devin pointed out two weeks ago, when we compromise, we have to rationalize what it is we are doing. We have to convince ourselves why the 12 things Jesus listed are okay for us to do. And I'm, a, I'm very simple. You know why we do some of the 12 things that Jesus just listed? It's really quite simple. It's because we like to. We derive a certain form of pleasure from these things. Now, I'm not saying that we derive pleasure from all of them, but I bet if you're honest, you probably could find ways that you divine pleasure to get pleasure from at least half of them. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. For all of us, some of these things bring us pleasure. The compromise originates in our hearts. This is fundamental. I mentioned that only two times Jesus called the crowd to him. And I want to remind you what he said the other time that he called the crowd to him. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Denying ourselves is denying the evil desires of our hearts. It's how we are to fight the desire to compromise our conscience. In addition to denying the desires of our hearts, we are called to pursue the fruit of the Spirit, which we find in Galatians 5, which says the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is what God wants to replace the, the sinfulness of our hearts. And the good news, the good news is that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. So as we deny ourselves and we strive for love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, the more the fruit of the Spirit defines us, the less power the sin nature of our hearts have upon us. 
It is how God transforms us. Transformed lives where we live visibly different lives because of our faith in Jesus. There is no more powerful witness to our faith than when our lives are transformed by the Spirit of God because of our faith in Jesus. And the evil one knows this, which is why he is always trying to get us to follow the evil desires of our hearts and compromise our conscience. There is no more powerful witness to the faith than when our lives are transformed by the Spirit of God because of our faith in Jesus. Please pray with me. And Lord, we do confess that there are times when we take pleasures from the evil desires in our hearts. And Lord, we thank you that by the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are forgiven and our hearts can be made clean, clean from the inside. And so, Lord, I would ask that your spirit would come upon us this morning. And Lord, maybe show us a way in which um, we compromise, compromise our conscience. And Lord, assure us of your forgiveness and your cleansing power. And it's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Receive God's blessing. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.